What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome back to our 17th example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now today's example video is gonna be all on rings, so with my introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our first example here. Now I have eight examples planned for today's video, so let's go ahead and read this first one, which says show that Q of the square root of two and the square root of three, which is equal to the following set, it's all numbers of the form a plus b times the square root of two plus c times the square root of three plus d times the square root of six, such that we have a, b, c, and d are, are, are all rational numbers is a ring. And we also wanna see if it is a field. Now I want to remind you that in order to show something is a ring, we have a few things to show, all of which are listed in the lecture video corresponding to this example video, which you should go ahead and check out if you haven't already. But those things are, we need to prove that the corresponding group with addition is an abelian group. We need to prove that multiplication is associative as well as distributive from the left and from the right. And lastly, we need to prove that it is in fact closed under multiplication. So let's go ahead and get into the first one of those. And let's prove that this ring with addition is in fact an abelian group. So go ahead and write that. The first thing we are going to prove is that Q with addition is abelian in a group. So I'll write is abelian group. So from here, I have to remind you on what we need to do to prove that this is a group and that this is abelian. Of course, abelian means that it is a commutative group, but we also need to recall what we need to prove to prove that this is a group in the first place. And that will be that it has an identity, it has inverses, that it is closed, and that it is associative. And again, as a stinger, because we wanna prove that it is an abelian group, we need to prove that it is also commutative. So start with, let's do the easy part and let's list what the identity is here. So we can see that very easily, the identity is simply going to be equal to zero. And that is because if you add zero to anything, you will simply get what you started with. And we can see that we can achieve that with our setup for our group here. As we just plug in zero for each of our coefficients here, we will get zero. Great, so now we wanna show that there are in fact inverses. So once again, inverses will be pretty straightforward. Let's say we have some element from our group here. So let's just call that element X and that's in our group here, which we'll denote as Q plus X inverse is going to just be equal to negative X. And so we can see that that's again using basic principles of addition. If we add X to negative X, we will simply get zero, which is our identity, which gives us inverses here. And because this group's operation is regular addition, this will group will of course be both associative and commutative. So I'll go ahead and write that, that we have associativity and commutivity. And I'll just go ahead and write that that is by construction. As by the fact that we are using standard addition as our operation, we have built in that we have associativity and commutivity. So now all we have to do is check to make sure this is closed. So I'll go ahead and write that we are doing closure now. So let's just take two arbitrary elements from this group here. Let's say A plus B times the square root of two plus C times the square root of three plus D times the square root of six. And to that we will add, let's just use the coefficients A1, then plus B1 times the square root of two plus C1 times the square root of three and lastly plus D1 times the square root of six. We wanna make sure that when we add these two elements we will get something that is in our group. But we can see that very easily by simply combining our like terms here. So out front we can see we'll have our regular rational part, that'll be a plus a1. Then we'll have plus our square root of two coefficients and that will be b plus b1 times the square root of two. And that will be plus c plus c1 times the square root of three. And then lastly, plus d plus d1 times the square root of six. And since we have that all of our a, b, c, and d's are rational numbers, all of these coefficients will also be rational numbers. So this will obviously be in our group here, which is like I said, Q plus. Great, so since we have identity, inverses, associativity, commutivity, and closure, this is in fact an abelian group, which means we have done which means we have proved the first thing we need to prove in order to show that this is a ring. So now what we wanna show is that this is closed under multiplication, that this is associative under multiplication and that this is distributive under multiplication. So let's go ahead and get into those proofs now. So we have for free that this is both distributive and associative under multiplication, just given by the fact that it is associative and distributive in R. 
So I'll just go ahead and write that. So we have that this is both associative and distributive due to the fact that it lives in R. And now all we have to do is check that this is closed under multiplication. So let's go ahead and check that it is closed under our multiplication operation. So I'll just say closed under and then use a dot there. So to show that this is closed under multiplication, all we have to do is multiply two arbitrary elements and see if the result is also within this potential ring here. So let's go ahead and take those two arbitrary elements. Let's just write them in the following way. So we'll write a plus b times the square root of two plus c times the square root of three plus d times the square root of six. And we'll multiply that into another arbitrary element. Let's just say a one plus b one times the square root of two plus c one times the square root of three plus d one times the square root of six. Now from here, I want to note a few things. I'll just go ahead and say them verbally. So what we want to do in order to show that this is closed quickly is rule out all of the combinations of these coefficients that are obviously within our cube square root of two square root of three. So we should be able to see very easily right here that any multiple of a and a one that we'll get from foiling these two things out is going to be in our potential ring Q as desired. And that is because if we multiply any of these by a rational number, we will obviously get something in Q. So go ahead and write that any multiples of A1 and A are in our Q square root of 2 square root of 3 here. Great. And so similarly, we can see that if we multiply B times the square root of 2 into B1 times the square root of 2, we will get just a rational number and that will of course be in our Q here and that will be the same for if we multiply two C's together and multiply two D's together so I'll go ahead and write that any multiple of B and B1 C and C1 and D and D1 is also in our Q here. Basically, if you multiply our B's together, that's in Q. If you multiply our C's together, that's in Q. And if we multiply our D's together, that is in Q. So we've covered all multiples of A and all multiples that double up. So now we wanna look at B and C multiples, B and D multiples, and C and D multiples for our last combinations. So let's go ahead and look at those. So let's go ahead and note the following, and that is b times the square root of two times c1 times the square root of three. And this will of course go for the reverse, which would be, I guess, c times the square root of three times b1 times the square root of two in exactly the same manner. So let's see what we get here. Well, when we multiply these, we'll just get b times c1, and then the square root of two and the square root of three will multiply to be the square root of six, but obviously that is in Q, as we have all rational coefficients of the square root of six covered in our group Q here, so we are good for that. So then we wanna look at B and D. So we have B times the square root of two times D1 times the square root of six. And like I said, symmetrically D times B1 will work exactly the same way. Well, that's going to be equal to B times D1 and the square root of two and square root of six will combine to be the square root of 12. But we can factor out a four from the square root, which will just come out as a two. So this is equal to two times B times D1 times the square root of three. And of course, two times two rational numbers will be a rational number. And we have all rational coefficients of the square root of three, which is in our Q here. So this will be in Q of the square root of two and the square root of three here. So that covers all multiples of B. Now all we need to do is check multiples of C and D and we will be done here. So let's go ahead and consider C times the square root of three times, let's just say D1 times the square root of six. Well, that's going to be equal to C times D1 and the three and six will be the square root of 18. But just like we did for the one above this one, we can factor out a nine of that and it will come out as a three and we'll get three times C times d1 times the square root of, well, let's see, when we divide 18 by nine, we will get the square root of two. And we have all rational coefficients of the square root of two in our Q here, so we are done. So all I did here was show that every possible combination of these coefficients must be in our Q here. And in doing so, I have proved that there is no way that the multiple of these two arbitrary elements will not be in Q as every single piece of them is in Q. Great, so this is in fact closed under multiplication, which is all we needed to prove to show that this is a ring. 
So let's go ahead and see if it's also a field. So all we need to do to show that this is a field is show that it has a multiplicative identity, that multiplication is commutative, and that we have every single element is a unit, that is to say it has a multiplicative inverse. So let's check the first two first. So first we wanna see if we have a multiplicative identity here, and we do in fact as we can just use the number one because one is a rational number. So if we plug it in for our general form here, we can just plug in one for our A and the rest B, C, and D can be zero as those are all rational numbers and we will have a multiplicative identity here. So we'll go ahead and write that one is in fact in our ring Q square root of two and square root of three. Next, we would want to show that this is commutative, but just like for associativity and distribution, of course, multiplication is commutative, which just comes from R. So I'll go ahead and write that this is commutative from R. And so lastly, we have to prove that every single element is a unit, or that is to say that it has a multiplicative inverse. That is also in the ring here. So this is definitely going to be the tricky part, so let's go ahead and get into it. So to show that every single element of our group Q square root of two and the square root of three is a unit, I'm going to use the fact that Q of the square root of two is a field. I'm just gonna go ahead and state that this is a ring, and then I will show you that it is a field from this, but I don't think the proof that it is a ring is going to, is going to be much different than what we've already done for this ring here. So I'll just leave that to you to work out for homework if you'd like. So to show that this is a ring, I'm simply going to show that Q of the square root of two has multiplicative inverses, as like I said, pretty much everything I've said previously about the ring that we are working on applies to this as well. So let's find an inverse for an arbitrary element of Q of the square root of two, and then see how that's gonna help us prove that our ring that we're working on now also has inverses. So let's take an arbitrary element from Q of the square root of two, and that will be of the form A plus B times the square root of two. And like I said, that will be in this here. And so what we wanna do is note the following, and that is that A plus B times the square root of two times A minus B times the square root of two is equal to the following. Well, we'll have A squared, then our A plus, then our A times B times the square root of two. We'll cancel out with our A times negative b times the square root of two, so we'll be left with a squared and then uh, the product of b times the square root of two and negative b times the square root of two, which is obviously minus two b squared as the square root of twos will cancel out. And so what we're gonna do here is divide by this over here so that we have a one on our right hand side and that will give us our inverse for this arbitrary element here. So that means that a plus b times the square root of two times a over a squared minus two b squared minus b over a squared minus two b squared times the square root of two is equal to one. And so you can see here we have found our inverse as desired. And so because we have a found an inverse for our q, to, for our q of the square root of two, this is in fact a field, which again we are going to use for our ring that we are working on here. So now we can go ahead and work on this ring. So let's go ahead and take an arbitrary element from the ring for this problem. And we'll write that as a plus b times the square root of two plus c times the square root of three plus d times the square root of six. And that will be in q of the square root of two and the square root of three there. And so what we wanna do is note the following. And that is that we can write this a plus b times the square root of two plus c times the square root of three plus d times the square root of six in the following way as elements of q square root of two up here. Great. And so what we can group and so we can group those in the following way. This will be equal to a plus b times the square root of two, which is obviously a member of our field up here. And this will be plus, well, we can factor out a square root of three here to get a coefficient that is in q of the square root of two. And that will be c plus d times the square root of two. And then we'll have this square root of three out here. So what we're gonna do is call this coefficient alpha and this coefficient beta. So this will be equal to alpha plus beta times the square root of three, where our alpha and our beta are elements of Q of the square root of two. And so now we're gonna use a similar method to what we use to calculate the inverse for Q of the square root of two to prove that it was a field. So let's go ahead and do that now. So now we're gonna look at 
alpha plus beta times the square root of three times alpha minus beta times the square root of three. And just like before, that is gonna be equal to alpha squared minus three times beta squared. And then we are going to divide this over to our left-hand side so that we can have one on the right-hand side. So that will give us alpha plus beta times the square root of three, which if you recall is just equal to our arbitrary element from our ring here. And that is going to be times, well, let's see, we'll have alpha over the denominator alpha squared minus three beta squared. And that will be minus beta over alpha squared minus three beta squared. And that will be times the square root of three. And this is equal to one. And now is where we use the fact that Q of the square root of two is a field. So I'll go ahead and write since what I'm going to underline in purple here, this is excluding the square root of three on this second term here. But since this is in Q of the square root of two and that Q of the square root of two is a field, we have that this entire thing here must be an element of Q of the square root of two and the square root of three. We can conclude that this blue box here is in our desired ring, which is all we need to show that this is a valid inverse for alpha plus beta times the square root of three, which if you recall, is just a rewriting of an arbitrary element from our ring here. So we can conclude that this is in here. Now, you might also wanna prove that we did not divide by zero throughout this entire process, but I think it's okay for this video. So since we proved that we have inverses and we also have that one is in the ring and it is commutative, we have proved that this is a field. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this second example, we want to see if this is a ring and it's given by a plus b times the cubed root of two where a and b are rational numbers. So we're gonna to wanna to prove the same things that we wanted to prove for the last one. That is that this set with addition is an abelian group that multiplication is associative and distributive, and lastly, that multiplication is closed. So let's look at the group first. So let's go ahead and look at, let's call this thing here R, and let's write our abelian group as R with addition. So we can see that for our identity here, we can just use the number zero, just as we did in the last example, because we can plug zero in for A and B, and we will definitely have that zero is in R, and obviously if you add zero to anything, it will be, it will return what you put in. So next we wanna see that there are inverses here. And once again, just by simple arithmetic logic, the inverse of an element, let's just say X, which is in R, is going to be given by negative X, just from basic negative in positive cancellation there. And so both associativity and commutativity will come from the fact that this lives in R. And so there, I've written that there. So now all we have to do is check that this is closed under addition. So I'll go ahead and check this for closure by taking it two arbitrary elements here. So let's look at a plus b times the cubed root of two plus a one plus b one times the cubed root of two. But just like the last example, we can group these using our like terms, I guess. And that will give us a plus a one, which is of course in our ring as two rational numbers added together will obviously be a rational number. Then we will have plus b plus b one, which is of course a rational coefficient for the square root of two. And this is obviously of the form that we have desired for our ring here. So we'll say that this is in fact in our group under addition here. Great, so that finishes the proof off that this is in fact an abelian group here. So we're good there. So now we want to make sure that this is both associative and distributive, but just like the last one, we have associativity and we have that this is associative and distributive just from the fact that this lives in R here. So I'll go ahead and write that that is from R. So the last thing we have to check to prove that this is a ring is that it is closed under multiplication. So let's go ahead and check closure under multiplication. 
So let's take two arbitrary elements. Let's just say a plus b times the cubed root of two, and that will be times a one plus b one times the cubed root of two. And let's just go ahead and multiply this out. Well, we'll have a times a one here for our first thing, then we'll have plus a times b one times the cubed root of two. We can see that both of these will be in our set R here. Then next we will have a1 times b times the cubed root of 2. And then lastly, we will have plus b times b1. And these two cube roots of 2 will multiply out to be the cubed root of 4. And we can see that this is also in R, but this is unfortunately not in R here because we cannot simplify this expression anymore and we do not have any elements of the form of a rational times the cubed root of four in our set, so it is not closed under multiplication, which means it is in fact not a ring. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So this third example is very similar to our first example. We wanna show that Q of the cubed root of two, which is given by A plus B times the cubed root of two plus C times the cubed root of four with A, B, and C being rational numbers is a ring. And then we want to see if it is a field. So just like we did for the last one and the one before that, we first wanna consider this with addition. So let's go ahead and call this potential group with addition Q plus. And so we wanna see if it has an identity and you may have guessed by now that the identity for this is going to be zero. And just the same way as the last two, the inverses will be given in the same way where X in our group here, Q plus, its inverse is given by negative x. And similarly, we will inherit our associativity as well as our commutivity from R here. So I'll go ahead and write that, that this is associative as well as commutative from R. And then the only thing we have to check now is that this is closed under addition. So I'll go ahead and write that we are checking for closure under addition here. So let's see if a plus b times the cubed root of two plus c times the cubed root of four plus another arbitrary element, let's just say a one plus b one times the cubed root of two plus c one times the cubed root of four is in fact in our group here, q plus. But this is exactly the same as what we've been doing already. We will have a plus a1, which is obviously a rational and therefore in Q. Then we'll have plus b plus b1 times the cubed root of 2, which is a rational coefficient of the cubed root of 2, which is obviously in Q here. Then lastly, we will have plus c plus c1 times the cubed root of 4, and that is a rational coefficient of the cubed root of 4. So this is obviously going to be in our group here. Q plus, so it is closed under addition and thus in abelian group. I'll just go ahead and verbally say that this is both distributive and associative, just like the last two. So we can get right into checking to make sure that it is closed under multiplication to verify that this is in fact a ring. So let's go ahead and check this for closure under multiplication, which I'll just denote as a multiplication here. And let's go ahead and multiply two arbitrary elements from this set here. So we'll have a plus b times the cubed root of two plus c times the cubed root of four times another arbitrary element, a one plus b one times the cubed root of two plus c1 times the cubed root of four here. And so just like our first one, any multiple of a and a i is going to be in our set here, just due to the fact that all we'll be doing is multiplying by a rational into some other rational coefficient for something which is perfectly okay and still in q. But unlike the last one, we cannot immediately rule out our duplicate multiples or our b coefficients times each other and c coefficients times each other. So let's go ahead and look at those here. So let's see what our b times the cube root of two times b1 times the cubed root of two will have for us. So that's going to give us b times b1 times the cubed root of four. But there we have a rational coefficient for the cubed root of four, which is obviously in our q here. So we are good there. And then we can look at our c's. So we'll have c times the cubed root of four 
times c1 times the cubed root of four. But that's simply going to be equal to c times c1 times the cubed root of four times four, but four times four is 16. And we can simplify that in the following way by extracting an eight out from the radical there. And when we pull it out, it will come out as a two. So we will have two times c times c1 times the cubed root of two. Now two times the product of two rational numbers will obviously be rational. And so we're left with a rational coefficient of the square root of the cube root of two, which is most obviously in Q here. So we are good for that one there. Now, all we need to do is check our B coefficients and our C coefficients products. So we can do that and it will symmetrically apply as we're going to check B times the cube root of two times C1 times the cube root of four. But like I said, this will apply to C times the cube root of four times B1 times the cube root of two. So what's this going to equal? Well, that'll equal B times C1. And then combining our radicals here, we will have two times four, which is eight, but we can simply satisfy that cubed root of eight as a two. And that will be equal to two times B times C1, which is a rational number on its own, which is obviously in Q there. So here we have proven that all possible combinations of these coefficients will be in Q so that their product must also be in Q without having to foil this whole thing out and go piece by piece. Great. So this is in fact closed under multiplication and now all we have to do is try and verify that it is a field. Well, just like before, it is easy to verify two of the three conditions we need to check to see that this is a field. First of all, we can see that the number one is in Q of the square root of two, and that is a satisfactory multiplicative inverse. We also have that this is commutative, or that multiplication is commutative, just by the fact that this lives in R here. And so now all we need to do is check that we have inverses. So for this one, in order to find a general formula for our inverse, let's just multiply two arbitrary elements from our ring here and then see what our coefficients would have to be to satisfy the fact that their product must be equal to one. So let's go ahead and look at that here. So let's take the product of, let's just say, a plus b times the cubed root of two plus c times the cubed root of four times another arbitrary element from this ring, which will be given by x plus y times the cubed root of two plus z times the cubed root of four here. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this out for you and then we will go ahead and proceed. And so when we multiply this out, we will get the following. I'm not gonna read this whole thing out, but we will get that there. Great, so now we want to think about the conditions that will need to be met in order for this to be equal to one. Well, there's not gonna be a single coefficient for the square for the cube root of two or the cube root of four other than zero that will allow this expression here to be equal to one. So that means we need all of our coefficients that are simply rational numbers to be equal to one and all of the combinations of the coefficients of the cubed root of two and the cubed root of four to be equal to zero. Using these facts, we can create a system of equations that we need to solve, which will give us the proper coefficients for our inverse here. So we need our rational coefficients to be equal to one. So we have, for those, we have a x, two c y, as well as two b z. So a x plus two b y plus two b z needs to be equal to one. And the rest of our coefficients need to be equal to zero. So starting with the cubed root of two, that'll mean the cubed root of two times b x plus the cubed root of two times a y plus two times the cubed root of two times c z must be equal to zero. And similarly for the cubed root of four, we'll have the cubed root of four times c x plus the cubed root of four times b y plus the cubed root of four times a z must be equal to zero. And I simply solved this for x, y, and z by plugging it into Mathematica. So I will share with you the solutions I got for that. And you're welcome to check that this inverse does in fact work on your own for homework. So let me go ahead and write out those x, y, and z for you here. And then we can go to the next problem. So the solution to that linear system is given by the following. And this will be the values for our coefficients that we can plug in to make our inverse. But since there is a solution to this system, we know that this is in fact a field as we have 
that every element from our ring is a unit, which coupled with the fact that one is in our ring, as well as that we have multiplication is commutative, we have that this is a field. Great. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for our fourth example, we have a simple little result here, and that is we want to show that it is impossible for an element of a ring to be both a zero divisor and a unit. And we are going to do this by way of contradiction. So let's go ahead and suppose our setup for a contradiction proof here. So by way of contradiction, let's go ahead and let our R be a ring. And we are going to take an element A, which is in R, with A being a zero divisor and a unit. So now we're gonna use both of these definitions to come to a contradiction. So let's start by applying the definition of A being a zero divisor. So if A is a zero divisor, then A is not equal to zero. And for some, let's just call it B, which is also in R with B not equal to zero, we have that A times B is equal to zero. Like I said, that is just the definition of it being a zero divisor. Now let's go ahead and apply the definition of A being a unit. So I'll go ahead and simplify that definition to the following statement. If we have that A is a unit, then we know that A inverse exists such that a times A inverse is equal to one. That's what it means for A to be a unit. It means we can take a product of A with another element of our ring R such that A times A inverse is equal to one. So now let's consider the following. We're gonna consider just the element B, but we're gonna multiply that B by a creative use of the identity, and that is A inverse times A and we will left multiply it by that identity there. We can see that A inverse times A is just the multiplicative identity, so we are good there. But now we can associate this in the following way, where we'll have A inverse times AB, and now we wanna use our definition of it being a zero divisor here, and what we'll get is, since, this, since A times B is equal to zero, we will have that this is equal to A inverse times zero, which is just equal to zero. But look what we have on our extreme left and right hand sides here. We have that B is equal to zero, but we assume that B is not equal to zero. So we have arrived at our contradiction, which completes this proof here. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this example, we are supposing that R is a ring with a multiplicative identity, and we have the set Rx, which is given by all u when in our ring R, such that u is a unit, and all we want to do is show that Rx is a group. So that means we need to show it has an identity, it has an inverse, it is closed under its operation, which in this case is multiplication, and that it is associative. So let's go ahead and get into that. So let's go ahead and look at, like I said, this will be Rx with an operation of multiplication, just so we're clear here. So we will have an identity given by the following, and that is simply one. That's pretty clear there. We don't need to check that this has inverses as at all, as by construction, every element of this set is a unit, which means it has a multiplicative inverse. So I'll just go ahead that we have inverses simply by construction. Every single element must have an inverse in order for it to be a unit. So this is by construction here. So for associativity, we will have that this is just like our previous examples in this video, that associativity is inherited, and that will be inherited from R here. And so now all that's left is to check that this is closed under multiplication here. So let's go ahead and check that this is closed. So let's go ahead and take two elements from our potential group Rx here. Let's just call them U and U prime, which like I said, is in Rx. Great. Well, by definition of it being in Rx, that means that U and U prime are both units. And by the definition of units, that means there must exist a V and V prime, which is also in Rx, such that, let's just say that the inverse of U is V and the inverse of U prime is V prime. And so now we want to note the following, and that is that u times u prime times v prime times v is equal to u times u prime times v prime, which we have defined to be inverses times v, 
but like I said, these are inverses, so they'll go to one, and this will simply be equal to u times v, which is also equal to one. So what we have shown here is that the product of u and u prime is a unit because it has an inverse given here. So that means by the definition of it being a unit that u times u prime is in our group Rx. And since this is closed under multiplication, this is in fact a group. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this example, we are going to let our ring R be given by the following, where it is the two by two matrices of the form A, B, zero, zero, such that A and B are real numbers. And we wanna show that this is a ring without an identity and that contains a subring S with an identity. So let's first prove that this is a ring here. So to first check that it is a ring, let's go ahead and consider our ring R with addition and show that this is an abelian group here. So let's note that this group does have an identity here and that identity is simply given by the, the two by two zero matrix here. So that's pretty easy to see. Similarly, because we are doing with matrix addition, the inverse is extremely easy to find and the additive inverse for A and let's just call it big A, which is in R is simply going to be equal to negative A. Like I said, just from simple addition rules there. And so now let's look at associativity, but because we're doing matrix addition, it functions mechanically the same as regular addition. So associativity is free. Similarly, we have a closure for free as well, as we cannot add any two real numbers and get not a real number. We cannot add zero to itself any amount of times and get anything other than zero. So like I said, closure is also free. And lastly, we have commutivity for free as well, as like I said, this functions exactly the same as regular addition. It's basically just four addition problems at the same time. So we have that commutivity is also free. Now, but now we have to check that multiplication is associative and distributive, which may not be so easy. So let's begin by checking that multiplication is associative. And in order to prove that this is associative, I wanna make the following observation. And that is that for two two by two matrices, let's just call them A1 and A2, which are in R. And we'll define those to be the following way, where A1 is equal to A1, B1, zero, zero, and a2 is equal to A2, B2, 0, 0. We have that A1 times A2 is simply multiplication by a little a1 into onto A2 here. And symmetrically, that A2 times A1 is simply multiplication by little a2 onto our big A1 there. And you can see that by simple matrix multiplication. If we swivel this first row of our big A1 into our first column of big A2, we will simply get an A1 times A2 there. And similarly for our second input, we will have little A1 times B2 there, and we will get zeros for our bottom two entries, which is just multiplication by A1 or scalar multiplication by A1. Great, so we can use this observation to very easily prove associativity given the fact that we can now view this operation as regular multiplication from the left. But these two statements put together prove that we have distribution from the left and we will prove distribution from the right after we are done with our associativity proof. So now that we have this observation out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our associativity proof. So to do this, we are gonna use the same definitions that I expressed in my observation here, but I'm also going to define in A3, which will define in the same way that we did A1 and A2, and that will be equal to little a3, little b3, zero, zero. Great, and we want to consider A1 times A2 times A3, and we wanna show that that is equal to A1 times A2, quantity times A3. So let's first multiply A2 and A3, which is very easy. Now that we know that that is just scalar multiplying by little a2. So this is going to be equal to A1 times the matrix. Like I said, scalar multiplying A3 by little a2. This will be A2, A3, and A2, B3. Zero, zero. And when we multiply by a1 from the left, that's the same as scalar multiplying by little a1. So this will be equal to a1, a2, a3, and a1, a2, b3, 
zero, zero. And so let's check what we would get if we multiplied a two on the outside here, and we have a one times a three. Great. So let's go ahead and multiply what we have inside the parentheses there first. So this will be a two, our big matrix a two times, and like I said, we can view the multiplication from the left by a one as a scalar multiplication by little a one. So that's gonna be little a one times little a three. And our second entry will be little a one times b three, and then we will have zero and zero here. And now we can resolve our a two there on the left as a scalar multiple at, by little a two. So this will simply be equal to a1 times a2 times a3, and our second entry will be a1, a2, and b3, and 0, 0 here, and we can see that those two are equal. So here we have proved associativity. So now all we need to do is check distribution from the right. So let's look at a1 plus a2 times a3. And we wanna show that that's equal to a1 times a3 plus a2 times a3. Well, let's resolve the middle part first, or the parentheses first. So this is equal to the matrix A1 plus A2 and B1 plus B2 and zeros here, and that will be times A3. But that is just going to be equal to the following matrix, which is given by A1 plus A2 times A3 and A1 plus A2 times b3 with zeros here. And so now we wanna check what we would get if we have a one times a three plus a two times a three. Well, that's gonna be equal to the following. A one times a three will simply be equal to a one, a three, and then we'll have a one, b three, zero, zero, and that will be plus well, let's see, we'll have a2, a3, and then we'll have a2, b3, and zeros here. And so now we can add these together, and what we'll get is the matrix a1, a3, plus a2, a3, and then our second entry will be given by a1, b3, plus a2, b3, and then we will have zeros here. And we can see that we can factor out an A3 for this entry and a B3 for this entry, and we will get exactly what we had when we did this right here. So we have checked distribution from the right here, and thus we have proved that multiplication is distributed, which is the last thing we needed to prove to show that this is a ring. So now let's go ahead and show that this has a subring with the identity and show that that identity is not in this ring. So let's go ahead and let our big S be a subring of our ring here are given by the following, and that will be the set of all matrices A, 0, 0, 0, such that A is a real number. And so we wanna show that this subring S does in fact have a multiplicative identity that is not in R. So let's go ahead and note that we have, let's just denote this multiplicative identity as one, which is in S, which is given by the following and that is the two by two matrix, one, zero, zero, zero. And we can very easily see that if we multiply this into an arbitrary element from S, let's just say A, zero, 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 we will get simply our A, zero, zero, zero back. And similarly, if we multiply it from the right, we will get the same thing. So we have A, zero, 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 and we multiply it from the right by our identity, one, zero, zero, zero we will get our A000 matrix as well. And if we swivel our first row into our first column here, we'll have A, and then we will get zeros for the rest. So like I said, this is an identity because we can multiply it from the left or the right, and we will still get what we started with. Great, but that is not the case for R. So let's go ahead and note that the matrix given by zero, one, zero, 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 multiplied into an arbitrary element from our ring R, which will denote A, B, zero, zero. Well, if we multiply it by the left, that will of course be equal to A, B, zero, zero because of that scalar multiplication rule that we outlined at the beginning. Scalar multiplication by one here will obviously give us the same thing. However, if we multiply it from the right, we see we're gonna have some problems, and that is because of the same scalar multiplication rule I talked about earlier. 
So if we multiply AB into 1, 0, 0, 0, we will get scalar multiplication by A, but that's just going to give us A, 0, 0, 0. And we can see that these two matrices are not equal, so we have that 1 is not in our ring R. Great. Now, if you want to check for homework to make sure that S is a subring, you can go ahead and do that, but I think it's fairly evident. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this example, we are going to let big X be any non-empty non set. We're going to let the power set of X be the set of all subsets. Like I said, it is the power set. Then we want to define the following for two elements of the power set of X. And we want to define the operations in the following way. So we have A plus B is equal to a set minus B union B set minus A, and we have that A times B is equal to A intersect B. So there we have our two binary operations, and we want to show that these operations make the power set of X into a commutative ring with identity. So in order to show that this is a commutative ring with a identity, which in this case means multiplicative identity, we have quite a few things to show. So let's go ahead and note some of those things which are immediately evident just from our setup here. So let's go ahead and note that the empty set will be our additive identity. And that is pretty clear if you look at the definition of addition here. If we have A plus the empty set and we set minus the, uh, the empty set from A and union it with the empty set minus A, we of course simply get A which makes the empty set an additive identity. Similarly, we should note that the power set of X is our multiplicative identity here by the same logic. If we multiply an arbitrary set A by the power set of X, since we know that A is an element of the power set of X, obviously their intersection will just be equal to A. So there we have an additive and a multiplicative identity there. So that proves one of the things we want to check and that this, that this is a ring with identity. So let me go ahead and also note that addition is associative just from observation by the way this is set up. Let's also note from the definition of our operations here that the additive inverse of A which is in the power set of X is simply equal to A. And that is because if we add A to itself, we will have A set minus A, which is simply the empty set, union A set minus A, and the union of the empty set and the empty set is the empty set, so we have an additive inverse there. So now let's go ahead and show that this is a commutative ring with identity by showing that this is commutative, that multiplication is associative, and that multiplication is distributive. So let's go ahead and first show that this is a commutative ring. So to get into the proof that this is a commutative ring, let's start off by showing that P of X with addition is commutative. As we've already shown that it has an additive inverse, that it's associative and has an additive identity, all we have to do is show that addition is commutative to complete the proof that P of X with addition is an abelian group. And we don't really need to check closure because it's pretty clear if you add two elements from the power set of X, we're not gonna get anything outside the power set of X. So let's go ahead and note the following to show that the addition operation as defined above is commutative. So let's go ahead and note that A plus B is defined to be the following, and that is A set minus B union B set minus A. But union is commutative, so that is equal to B set minus A union A set minus B, which is exactly the definition of B plus A. So we have that addition is commutative, which is all we need to show to show that P of X with addition is a commutative group. Great. So now let's go ahead and finish by checking that this is a commutative ring. That is to say that multiplication is commutative, and we also need to show that multiplication is distributive and associative. So let's go ahead and get to those proofs now. And let's start with the proof that multiplication is commutative, and that's extremely straightforward, and we're gonna do that by the following observation. We're going to note that A times B is simply equal to A intersect B, but intersection is commutative, so that will give us B intersect A, which is of course equal to B times A, and that gives us that our multiplication is commutative here. Great. So now we need to check that it's associative and distributive. So let's go ahead and check that it's associative first. And we're going to do that with the following observation. We're going to note that A times B times C is equal to A intersect B intersect C, but that's simply equal to A intersect B intersect C, which is of course equal to 
A intersect B intersect C, but that's exactly equal to A times B times C. We have that multiplication is associative. So now all we need to prove is that multiplication is distributive, which is really gonna be our only difficult proof here. So let's go ahead and get into that. So to get in our proof that multiplication is distributive, let's go ahead and let A, B, and C be in P of X. And then let's go ahead and consider A times B plus C. And then we'll just use our definitions of multiplication and addition here. So that's just gonna be equal to breaking it down. A intersect all of B plus C. If you recall, all of B plus C is simply B set minus C union C set minus B. But then we can go ahead and distribute that intersection across both of those there. But that is simply going to be equal to the following and that will be A intersect B set minus C. And that will be union A intersect C set minus B. Great but we can rewrite this in the following way using the definition of the complement of a set. So we can write this as A intersect B intersect C complement. And this whole thing will be union A intersect C intersect B complement. And I'm gonna use that prime notation to represent complement for the, for the rest of this proof, but we can rewrite that in the following way. And that will be as A intersect B intersect a complement union C complement, and that will be union the following, and that will be A intersect C intersect A complement union B complement. But we can rewrite that in the following way where we will have A intersect B intersect A intersect C all complement, and that will be union A intersect C intersect A intersect B all complement. But that's the same thing as A intersect B set minus A intersect C, and that will be union A intersect C set minus A intersect B. But we can see that everything I'm about to underline in purple, we can write using multiplication. So making that substitution is going to give us A times B minus A times C, and that will be union A times C set minus A times B. And I guess I should keep my parentheses here just so we're clear on what we are unioning here. But you'll see that that is just the definition of addition, and that will be the addition of A B plus A C. Great, so if we go to the top, you can see what we did here. We started with A times B plus C, and we ended up with A B times A C. Great. Now you could similarly prove the distribution from the right there, but I'll leave that to you for homework. So let's go ahead and get into our final problem. So for this final problem, we are going to be dealing with something called a Boolean ring, and we have that defined here. So we have a ring R is called a Boolean ring. If for all little r in our ring big R, we have that little r squared is equal to r. We wanna show that every Boolean ring is commutative. And so we're gonna do this using the fact that all Boolean rings are of characteristic two. So let me go ahead and make that claim, and then I will prove it for you here. So my claim is that all Boolean rings are of characteristic two. So let me go ahead and make that proof for you here. So let's go ahead and consider R plus R. Well, by the definition of Boolean ring, we know that R squared is equal to R. So that means R plus R must be equal to R plus R quantity squared. But we can simply multiply that out and that will give us four copies of R squared here. Great. So we have four copies of R squared, but once again, we know that R squared is equal to R. So this is simply equal to R plus R plus R plus R. But we can see looking at this left-hand side and this right-hand side, we can simply subtract R plus R from both sides. And this will mean that R plus R is equal to zero. But if R plus R is equal to zero, that's exactly what it means for this to be of characteristic two. Great. So now we're gonna go ahead and use the fact that this is characteristic true two to show that every Boolean ring is commutative. And so let's go ahead and make the following observation, which will complete this proof. So let's go ahead and observe that for all R and R prime, which are in our ring big R, we have the following. And that is that R plus R prime is equal to R plus R prime 
squared, and that's again by the definition of this being a Boolean ring, but we can multiply that out and we will get r squared plus r r prime plus r prime r and then plus r prime squared. But now we can make the replacement using our Boolean definition once again and show that this is equal to r plus r r prime plus r prime r plus r prime. But we can subtract r and r prime from the left hand side here to cancel out our r and our r prime here and we'll simply be left with the following and that is that zero is equal to r r prime plus r prime r. And so now I can add r times r prime to both sides of this and that will give us r times r prime on the left hand side and on the right hand side this will give us r times r prime plus what we had left on the right hand side r times r prime plus r prime times r. But now is where we can use the fact that this is of characteristic 2. And using the fact that this is of characteristic 2, we can cancel out these two terms here. And that will simply give us on our left hand side r r prime is equal to what is left on this side, and that is r prime r. So that finishes this one off here. And since that's our last example, that's a good place to stop.